Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thank you for joining me today on this tour and comparison of Swiss and German style decks um, featuring the Besançon variant. Now if you are a fan of the show uh, you know that I do like um, to explore different variations on um, older tarot decks and so we're going to be comparing three today. Um, the first is a reproduction of the Taroki de Besançon Miller of 1780. And this is a German deck, um, but it definitely has some Swiss influences. And this is um, one that features uh, Juno. We can see her here on the cover instead of the second card and Jupiter instead of the fifth. So that's what a what a basin on deck means is um, it subs subs both of those cards. Um, this uh, production is by Giordano Berti, an Italian card maker, and he does such a nice job. I absolutely love his card stock. It's my favorite of any um, historic reproduction. But he also does these deluxe boxes that are uh, lined with paper and lined with velvet and come with booklets um, telling you both how to read with these historic tarots, but also um, a lot of great history on particular decks. So this booklet um, discusses tarot decks from German countries from the 16th to the 18th century. And this is just one. Um, he does have a couple of others as well. So, um, so that's our first deck, this one on the right with these backs here. Then the second deck we're going to discuss is the Tarot Francois Gassman of 1840. Um, this is a Swiss deck and it is a traditional deck in that it has um, the Pope and, and Popes um, or Papes instead of the Juno and Jupiter cards. But I wanted to pull it out, pull it out and compare um, the color palette of this deck with our German deck um, because there's some similarities there. And also because there's other similarities um, between this deck, which features a more Swiss style and the decks that we'll see um, next to it. So this is our middle deck. It has these beautiful bird's egg um, blue backs with the little squiggles and dot pattern and this is historic um, both of these have historic backs so this is a scan of an original card reproduced and it has a museum stamp on it and then this is a reproduction of the original Gassman backs or at least one version I think there's a couple of different versions of the Gassman in different museum collections um, but at least one of them features this lovely blue color and then uh, third we have the classic 1JJ Swiss tarot cards. Um, now this is the famous US Games production of this. Um, uh, my copy was printed by A.G. Mueller and this was the first tarot deck. This was the deck that launched a whole tarot career and tarot history interest and basically um, enabled tarot to become what it is today um, in the popular consciousness um, because this was the first deck that Stuart Kaplan ever had and it's what he started US Games with. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I, I wanted to get a copy of this. I was going to avoid it originally because actually the artwork doesn't appeal to me that much. But for sort of history's sake and collecting sake and, and all of that, I felt like I should probably have a copy in my collection. This deck is based on a 19th century deck. Um, so sometime in the 1800s, but I actually don't know that much about it. Um, what I do know, and I just found this out by looking on the Eclectic Tarot Forum for more information, is that the 1JJ, the J and the J stand for Jupiter and Juno, who are the substitute car cards here. So um, again, this is a tarot based on Sun style with those two cards instead of the second and the fifth. And that's where the name comes from. Makes sense. Um, now, my copy also came as part of this larger tarot fortune telling kit uh, or game. And this comes with a booklet, the deck, um, a big spread kind of poster. Um, and this was one of the ways this deck was marketed. It was also marketed as just a standalone tarot deck, but this is one is meant to be played in a game style format with other people. Um, this does say Deluxe Edition, and it says the Circa 14th Century Tarot. Now, tarot wasn't actually on the scene until the 15th century, um, but, you know, never mind the facts. Um, it's also a little unclear to me when exactly this was produced. Copyright varies between 1974 and 1970 on different pieces of this kit. 
So um, if you have any information, let me know. I do know that these cards were printed by A.G. Mueller in Switzerland. And I think what happened originally was that um, Stuart Kaplan went to Europe. He's, he went to England, actually, and he saw this deck in a shop and got a copy of it. And it was already being produced by A.G. Mueller. And so he just continued that on for a while. And actually, um, A.G. Mueller printed a lot of the early U.S. games uh, decks until something happened and that business relationship resolved, uh, dissolved. So that's about as much as I know about it. I don't know what the original backs on this deck would have been, but I think this is historically-ish accurate for some decks produced around this time period um, in the 1800s. But I don't have a lot of hard details on that. So if you know more about the origins of the 1JJ Swiss or, you know, when it originally came on the scene before Stuart Kaplan got hold of it, um, let me know in the comments. All right, um, just a quick uh, kind of review. So here, this is um, 1780, was originally produced by Joseph Rausch Miller um, around that time period from Salzburg in Germany. And Giordano Berti has licensed it from the British Museum. So this, the, so his copy um, comes from the British Museum. Then we have the Gasman, and this is um, a facsimile produced. I think he's is lightly retouched um, facsimile from Yves Renault in France. Um, he is absolutely famous for his Tarot de Marseille reproductions. He's got dozens of them now. Um, and he talks about a father and son, the Gassmans. Um, and we think this was um, Francois Gassman, um, who's probably the son. And this restoration is based on several originals from the Swiss Game Museum of La Tour de Pietz in uh, Switzerland. So that's where his originals are from. And I've actually seen uh, images of those online as well, with these bright greens. Um, and then, like I said, the third one, you know, it's part of this kit, and I don't know a lot about the specific origins of when this was originally produced or printed, um, or what decks may have directly influenced it. It does look quite Italian to me. It looks, um, in terms of the engraving and the way a lot of the faces are drawn, it looks more Italian than Swiss or French or anything else to me, but that's just kind of my own um, personal interpretation. Um, even down to like the flesh tones and the coloration, this is a modern um, Scopa deck um, from Sicily. Um, and yeah, it just, it has, a, I don't know, it's like the bold colors and the way the engraving is. It also sort of reminds me of the Soprofino um, in terms of all of this detail here in the etching and the engraving. So it's interesting to see that the, um, the you know, the content uh, of it is definitely Swiss, um, but the production of it looks more Italian. Um, I will say that I've already done walkthroughs of this deck on the channel, and I, I did publish an earlier um, walkthrough of the Miller compared with another deck by um, Giordano Berti. It's the Vergnano, and that's an Italian deck, um, a Piemontese Italian deck. And, you know, I just wanted to do it because I had just gotten these two decks and I was really pleased with both of them and wanted to share them. But I've hidden that video because I think this is going to be a better comparison um, in, term, in terms of looking at the art style and the details and how they, how they, um, how they work. And then these two also being based on San decks, they have that element in common. Um, and I'm going to do another video with the Vergnano compared with two other Paymontese decks. So uh, look out for that. But I think I think that's more cohesive. So um, if you've already seen the other video posted, I apologize. But um, I think this one, you know, it just makes more sense to do it this way. So um, and I didn't have this deck at the time that I made that original video. All right, I'm going to try not to stop and, you know, take forever to go through this. Um, I do tend to really be quite chatty when I do these, and I like to point out all a million little details and stuff. But here I'll just say what strikes me is not only the similarity of content, but particularly with these two decks, the similarity in the color palette. You've got these beautiful golds, this sort of bright sage green, um, 
and this very deep navy blue. And I absolutely love the colors in both of these decks. It's one of the main reasons that I have these uh, particular decks in favor of other decks that I could have gotten. Now here I'll just also pause and point out that we do have um, our substitute card. So the number two card instead of the La Pipis card that you find in a classical Marseille, you um, do have the goddess Juno. And contrary to maybe, um, you know, what you may have heard, this was not the Catholic Church saying don't put our Catholic figures into your deck. Um, it was Protestant um, card players saying, we don't want that papishness in our deck, thank you, we'd like somebody else. So um, that is why Juno appears here. Um, I would not interpret her the same way I would interpret La Pepes, so you can read about Juno and her attributes, and that's what I would bring into a reading if um, I was reading with a base ensemble deck, because these are not the same character, so I feel like they don't have the same meaning or the same message to give us. Um, Juno is always uh, depicted with peacocks. Here she just has the one peacock, and here she has two down here beneath her feet. And she's also always uh, usually depicted in this way with like flowing skirts and you know lots of lavish drapery, um, which is an interesting touch. So we have our Empress. And here we have tulip-shaped scepters, which is another Swiss uh, Swiss thing. So here it's a tulip and then a ball and cross above. Here it's sort of a tulip and sort of a fleur-de-lis. It's kind of a hybrid thing. And then here we have another little tulip-shaped scepter. And I do like that she has a plinth with an egg uh, shape up here. So here we have our Emperor card. Um, I do like the, that they all have beards. Um, you can see a lot of, again, similarities in the color palette here with the greens and blues. Everybody's got tulip-shaped scepters. Uh, this guy's is a little bit less pronounced in that tulip shape, but it doesn't have the, you know, the traditional cross or the ankh or whatever um, you might see in other decks. These guys seem to be outside and this guy's inside, so that's interesting. And they all have very different uh, headgear on So here's our, in our Swiss deck, we have the Pope, Le, Le Pape, and then here we have Jupiter. And here he's got lightning uh, bolts in both hands and a crown. And then here he sort of looks a little glum. He's got his eagle um, and he's got like a magic wand, um, but he's not active. Uh, so that's kind of funny. Maybe he's having a bad day there. Um, here his eagle is underneath and behind him. And I'm going to go through these a little bit faster, but you know, if you're really into like the, the um, tarot type one, type two, Marseille comparisons and things like that, feel free to pause and you can kind of pick out your own details. I always appreciate a different perspective on the chariot. So here we have the two horses. They look quite undersized to be pulling this massive um, cart here and then our charioteer on top. And this is weird because it almost looks like he's standing behind a balcony and that the, the horses are just pulling some other kind of, um, you know, vehicle behind them. Like, like the top half of the card and the bottom half of the card don't go together. Um, yeah, that's very weird. And Justice. The Hermit. One thing I'll point out here in the Miller deck, um, there's a couple of cards that have kind of a Chinese um, art style to them, and this is one. 
um, chinoiserie or, you know, sort of cultural appropriation of Chinese and East Asian um, imagery and symbols and hairstyles and that kind of thing um, was pretty common um, during this time period. It was it was like a fashion craze. You know, people wanted to import textiles and, um, of course, China, you know, porcelain China um, and all of that into into their lives and, and use it to to, you know, decorate themselves and their lives. And um, so, yeah, so that's why you see it here. Um, I do like our blue lion on our gas man deck here in the middle. And I'll also point out, so um, strength or, or force um, with the lion and the woman is the later traditional um, appearance of this card. But if you look at early Italian decks, um, it's often Hercules wrestling a lion um, is the parable that goes along with this. Wrestling a lion or clubbing a lion. He's got a, li a club here. So this, um, again, has that tie-in back to earlier Italian style. And then the two decks on the right look quite Swiss, this um, Swiss guard uniform. Um, but our guy on the left is is not dressed that way, um, and he has a very different uh, look. He, he um, almost looks like he's the style that should ha be holding onto money bags, but I don't see money bags here. So his tongue sticking out, um, which is a sign of essentially um, suffocating to death as you're hanging upside down. But often he's depicted with money bags if he's got that kind of pose. So that's an interesting variation. We have our death card. I do like this guy's little round hat. And temperance, quite similar. And our devil. The Swiss tile devil that has um, hairy face and legs and bat wings. And then this guy just you know, breaks the mold. You know, he doesn't have any wings. Um, he doesn't have any imps. He just seems to be tormenting this poor woman. The tower. And here, um, in all three, you can see it's got the French title, The House of God. the star. Another reason I love this deck here, the Miller, is all the wigs. Um, so they all have these Mozart or Brahms style wigs on. Um, Mr. Bertie actually claims that, you know, Mozart would have been playing with, uh, with this kind of a deck. Um, and certainly it's feasible, you know. It's, this deck overlapped his lifetime and was in the region where he was, so, uh, so that's pretty fun. I do like this um, depiction here, this uh, of a, a lover serenading um, with his dog next to him. We still get the crustacean uh, for some reason, but it's on it's it's a decoration on a um, a bridge or aquifer or something. So we're like looking beyond this structure into this little garden. And then here we have more of this Chinese style. Um, you know, hints here with the way that these towers are drawn, the way the dogs are depicted, and this type of bridge. Um, it looks, it sort of looks like we're in a more Chinese style garden. And that was certainly an influence that was prevalent across Europe at this time. Sun card. Again, our one JJ Swiss departs from that a bit. Judgment. One JJ Swiss, also different here. Although, you know, similar idea. And then the world. All of these um, aces of batons. 
um, are quite Italian. These are very Italian with the rounded club. Um, you see this in a lot of Italian decks throughout the ages, including again in the modern Italian card playing decks. And then these are a little bit more of that Italian variation going into the French style with the, um, the different branches cut off. I do like to show all the cards, but I'm just going to whip through these. Um, however, I will say that I like all of the different color palettes that we get here throughout each of these because they're just different from that like primary blue, um, yellow, and uh, red. And you're getting a lot of green in a lot of these cards. So it just gives more visual interest when you're doing a reading than in those um, primary color decks that are, you know, the traditional French one, like the Grimo, uh, the Grimo deck, or some of the other um, reproductions, like the Jean Noble, um, or the um, Dodal, or things like that. I mean, those decks have their merits and they're they're historic, um, and so they're important for that reason. Oops, am I out of order here? No, no, there we go. Um, those decks are important because they're historic, but um, in terms of being able to read with them and enjoying the visual, they just don't appeal to me um, as much as you know some of these other um, decks with different color palettes do. So again, a little hint here. Um, anytime you see like a thin mustache or a different kind of a hat, um, there's a potential for that to be kind of a nod to this Asian aesthetic. Um, that was popular at the time period. I like this guy's mustache, and he certainly means business with that big club. This is interesting, the way his um, baton is two-toned. And our cup, and you can see here this very um, consistent Swiss influence in this kind of jelly mold style um, here with this uh, sort of fan shape coming up from the bottom of the cup. And then that's kind of mimicked here, and then this rounded top. So, and a Swiss cross, of course. So, yeah, very consistent. No dolphins in our JJ Swiss. We do get our um, dolphins, our traditional dolphins here. And then, I don't know what those are, if those are also some kind of redrawing of a, I mean, they kind of have scales down here. I don't know if they're like a sea dragon or something else. I like the use of grape leaves and vines in um, the one JJ Swiss. Of course, you would have wine in your cup, whether that was um, a secular or a church related activity, you would have wine. I like how these cups vary in this deck. In some cards, they're all the same color, and in other cards, they're not, or they vary between cards. So again, anything um, to give a different visual interest and just kind of help your brain be stimulated um, while you're doing readings is, I think, good. So and these two have helpful um, Roman numerals on the edges, and this one does not. So, and you don't have to count. I think if you play with these cards enough, you start to recognize patterns like you would on um, French style playing cards. You know, the way that the the diamonds or the, or the clubs or the whatever are arranged. Um, so 
you can you can quickly figure out which card you're looking at. Here you've got the tens kind of embedded in the design, and here they're off to the side. And this one has a different pattern than these two. So here's our page of cups. Um, this guy has the cloak over the cup. This one does not, um, but he's holding a hat and not a cover. Um, a hat, not a cover, and a hat, not a cover. Oh, cool. Um, sometimes it seems like they're wearing their hat but holding a cover for their cup, and it gets very confusing about what objects there are. The other thing is that this Valley of Cups looks like um, he's maybe had a few before he's delivering this cup to uh, who's, uh, whoever's called for it, um, and I think that's funny. Um, the Budapest Tarot is another early deck that I know of that shows, um, he actually shows a page uh, guzzling uh, from a cup. So it's kind of a funny nod back to that. This knight is turned away from us and I've got some other decks where the knights um, are not are not shown to the side but they're shown kind of you get the ass end of the horse. It's always funny. Very different style cups here in these three. I love the very realistic um, table leg here and then how it mimics his own leg. That's kind of fun. Uh, next we have the sword suit. That's funny. This has a little number down here. Um, I hadn't noticed that before. And all these are numbered. And again, if you have a number here and here, why do you need one there? Yeah, it's kind of kind of goofy. All of these have hilts that are distinct from the tips. So hilt and tip, hilt and tip. Um, whereas on a traditional Marseille or a more sort of, you know, 1700s uh, Marseille, you would just get this shape repeated on all of the ends. So you'd have identical um, shapes there. So this is like a Swiss trait again. Um, and the colors aren't quite as variable in this suit as they are in others, uh, but you still get a little bit of green on the 1JJ. I like this, it looks like a poppy pod. And do the swords go up or down? I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't read that as a significant detail typically, so I don't worry about it. Here's our ballet. Oh yay. And again, this nod to Asian influence. This almost looks like a Turkish style mustache that's brushed up. Our coins. And our title card. So made cards made. In Salzburg. So Carl, cards made in Salzburg, made by Gassman, card maker in Geneva, and made by the card 
the card house of Chef House in Switzerland. Consistency's sake, we'll do this. It's funny, I'm not picky about my swords, but I do like my three of coins to have the third coin on the top, not the bottom. But according to this, it would be upside down. So yeah, I guess these two agree because they were like that. And then this one's like this. So different colors and I do love how our Miller um, continues to incorporate the green tones into these coins cards. Different arrangements, different kinds of floral embellishments. And you can tell that, um, I should have said, the 1JJ Swiss really was made for card making. Um, at this point, I think in history, um, people were starting to play around with divination and tarot and using it for other things. But this deck is used in um, cards competitions. Even, even today, uh, the 1JJ Swiss is one of the decks that is, um, is used for that purpose. It's an official you know, competitive or competition deck. We have two coins on the valet, two coins on the valet, one coin. And again, some Asian influences with this hat and this funny little mustache and the long curly hair. And then here we have sort of more of a turban shape. Our queen. And our king. All right, well, thank you again for joining me for this comparative walkthrough of the Miller, the Gassmann, and the 1JJ Swiss. Um, I hope you liked it. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you observed that I may have missed, and I'll see you next time for more comparative tarot. Until then, be well.